Grace and peace be with you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Westminster Presbyterian Church. We welcome those of you who are joining us here in the sanctuary and the many more who are joining us online across time and space through the magic of the internet. Um, And I will say that we are encouraging people to take advantage of our streaming uh, service online if you are able to. Um, The COVID numbers in Dallas County have been going up, um, and so we are encouraging as many people as possible to stay home and to uh, stay safe as possible. And we do thank those of you who are here with us today for complying with the social distancing and the mask wearing. Uh, A few announcements before we get started. Um, There's an announcement about the interpretation of our survey results with Holy Cow now that the survey has ended. Um, That interpretation is not going to be this coming Sunday, uh, next Sunday the 22nd at 1.30. They're going to do a preliminary report for our mission study team and for our session at 1.30 next Sunday, and then there'll be the report for the congregation at a later date, which we have not set yet. Um, But next week, we will still be doing the uh, hanging of the greens uh, in preparation for Advent. So uh, if you are uh, here um, for the in-person service, you are uh, welcome to stay and help uh, decorate the church following that service. Um, Next Sunday is Christ the King uh, Sunday or Reign of Christ Sunday, which is the last Sunday of the liturgical year. It is a um, wonderful celebration of Christ's lordship. Uh, We will have a guest trumpeter next Sunday, so uh, special music. We are looking forward to that. Um, We have completed the stewardship campaign, but it is not too late to get your pledge card in. If you haven't already, you can bring a pledge card by the church office, you can mail it in, or if you look at the announcements, you can even fill one out online by following that very detailed HTML address. Just a heads up, we will have a Christmas Eve worship service that is uh, at 4.30 p.m. on Christmas Eve. It will be streamed online, um, but uh, for in-person attendance, we are going to limit that to 50 people, and so you will have to register in advance. Um, We have not uh, opened the online registration for that yet, but if you know that you plan to attend the Christmas Eve service in person, you can let Emily know um, so that you can reserve your spot for Christmas Eve. Um, And then another reminder that on first Sundays, uh, we will be worshiping indoors uh, for December and and January. So um, the first Sunday of December will not be outside, it will be um, indoors. Well, it is good to be gathered uh, physically and virtually uh, this morning. Let us now breathe in deeply together as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. You are invited to rise as able and as together we are called to worship. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Come into God's presence with thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God, king above all gods. Come, let us worship and bow down before the Lord, our Maker.
Let us pray. Ever living God, before the earth was formed and even after it shall cease to be, you are God. Break into our short span of life and show us those things that are eternal, that we may serve your purpose in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Please be seated. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence in faith and penitence. Let us confess our sin before God and one another. O merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves. As we cling to the values of a broken world, the profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousy that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and we have turned them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy on us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. There are some things that I love about my job. I love being called upon to be present for life events like funerals, like baptisms, and I love being able to stand in front of you each and every week to remind you that you are loved by God that you are chosen by God, that in these waters of baptism, we are one family. You are forgiven, you are cleansed, you are made whole. Friends, children, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we prepare to hear the voice of God through scripture, let us pray. O oh God, by your spirit, tell us what we need to hear and show us what we ought to do to obey Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Acts chapter 21, verses 7 through 36. This can be found in the New Testament of your Pew Bible on page 142. Now let's listen for God's word to the world. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemas, and we greeted the believers and stayed with them for one day. The next day we left and came to Caesarea, and we went into the house of Philip the evangelist one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. While we were staying there for several days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. He came to us and took Paul's belt, bound his own feet and hands with it, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is the way the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this and 
We and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am, not only, I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Since he would not be persuaded, we remain silent, except to say, the Lord's will be done. After these days, we got ready and started to go up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples of Caesarea also came along and brought us to the house of Nassim of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to stay. When we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers welcomed us warmly. The next day, Paul went with us to visit James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard it, they praised God. Then they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands of believers there are among the Jews, and they are all zealous for the law. They have been told about you that you teach all the Jews living, among the, living amongst the Gentiles to forsake Moses, and that you tell them not to circumcise their children or observe the customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Join these men, go through the rite of purification with them, and pay for the shaving of their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they've been told about you, but that you yourself observe and guard the law. But as for the Gentiles who have become believers, we have sent a letter with, your judge, with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from fornication. Then Paul took the men and the next day, having purified himself, he entered the temple with them, making public the completion of the days of purification when the sacrifice would be made for each of them. When the seven days were almost completed for the Jews from Asia, who had seen him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd. They seized him, shouting, fellow Israelites, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against our people, our law, and this place. More than that, he has actually brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Tophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was aroused and the people rushed together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple and immediately the doors were shut. While they were trying to kill him, word came to the tribune, the cohort, that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. Immediately, he took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. When they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came, arrested him, and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired, who they, he inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another, as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar. He ordered him to be brought into the barracks. When Paul came to the steps, the violence of the mob was so great that he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed him kept shouting, away with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Laurel. Um, during our Acts sermon series, every single one of our worship leaders says, Alex, this is a really long reading. And I say, yes, it's just that way during the sermon series. And there is just one simple explanation, and that is, I am torturing you. Um, 
that's a joke. Uh, we're trying to read the book of, of Acts together. Um, and I should also say before I start that I may have spent a little too long preparing for this sermon um, looking at the origin of a, of a, a hip-hop artist, a rapper in Georgia named Two Chains because he has an album called Real Religion. And I was convinced that his name was going to be connected to Agabus's prophecy but that is, not, that is not the case, alas. I was hoping that that would be true, but it was, it was not. So last week, uh, we, we heard Paul's famous speech on the Areopagus in Athens, where he ended up after fleeing the religious leaders in Thessalonica. Um, and then after that speech, Paul goes on to Corinth, and the pattern that we've talked about continues there, the pattern of him preaching to the synagogues and getting a less than warm welcome and, and then being taken to court and being harassed by the religious authorities. He winds up spending 18 months in Corinth, establishing the church there, and then he does another traveling circuit, revisiting the other Christian communities that he has established throughout the region, encouraging them, correcting their theological or their uh, doctrinal errors, um, and encouraging them to continue in the faith in Christ. Eventually, he ends back up in Ephesus, where he stayed for three years. And there, we hear about more miracles, these crazy things about like the towels that he carried touching people and those people being healed. Um, we hear more instances of the Holy Spirit coming with power and, and giving people the ability to prophesy in languages that were foreign to them. Um, this breakdown of cultural barriers is one of the most dominant themes in Acts. At one point in Ephesus, in Ephesus there is a riot that is started by the silversmiths. Riots are another theme in Acts. Uh, the silversmiths made idols for people's homes, and, and they start this riot because they are afraid that Paul's message about God and Christ will put them out of business. Later, Paul preaches a sermon in an upstairs room, and he goes on past midnight in that sermon, all the way until a guy named Eutychus, who's been listening while sitting in an open window, falls asleep and falls out of that window and dies. Luckily, Paul is able to bring him back to life, and then he goes upstairs and he preaches some more, all the way until dawn. So, whenever you complain about me preaching too long, just remember that I'm in, I'm in good company and it, must, and it could be worse. And from there, after that story of Eutychus, the, the story is just building up to what we just read this morning. We, we keep reading about how the Spirit is directing Paul to go back to Jerusalem in time for the festival of Pentecost. Yes, that same Pentecost festival where it all began, when the Holy Spirit first came a few years before to empower the people listening to speak in other languages. The Spirit has also testified to Paul that hostility and prison will be waiting for him in Jerusalem. And so this whole way, all of his friends are trying to talk him out of it. And there, it's important to remember that Luke is the author of Acts. That Acts is the sequel to Luke's gospel. And, and there's this similar buildup in the second half of Luke's gospel when Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem. And the writing is on the wall, and the reader knows that what he is going to is going to be certain suffering and death. So Paul is literally following in Christ's footsteps. The commentator Willie James Jennings writes that Jerusalem is the place where prophets suffer. 
Yes, Paul is headed to Jerusalem, the home of the temple where God was thought to dwell. He's headed to Jerusalem, which is the sacred place for God's chosen people. And ironically, that means that Jerusalem is a place of resistance to the Holy Spirit. Jerusalem means conflict. So Paul arrives in Jerusalem and he meets with the other Jewish Christians there. And they give praise to God when when they hear about the success that Paul has had with the Gentiles. But immediately we see that they are concerned for him because they've, they've heard this rumor that he's telling other Jewish believers, believers of Christ, that, that they no longer have to follow the Jewish law. Now this rumor, to be sure, is false, but when you think about it, you, you can see how it got started since Most of Paul's success has been with Gentiles. And even though Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, he's not requiring those Gentile believers in Jesus to start following the Jewish law. And so James and the other apostles make this plan to to try to protect Paul from the Jewish authorities. This, this plan with, with the purification ritual and, and, and Paul taking the vow and joining in with the others who are having their heads shaved and, and paying for them to do that, it's all, it's all pure politics, really. Paul, you have to show these people who you are. You have to show these people your Jewish roots. You have to show them that you are one of us, that you are an authentic, devout, law-abiding Jew. And and so they make this plan, and and he goes through with the seven-day purification ritual, but it doesn't work. The conspiracy theory narrative has already taken hold because he has been fraternizing with the Gentiles. It's too late for Paul. He's already compromised. They already see him as a gino, a Jew in name only, which sounds dirty, I know, but it isn't. It doesn't matter his Torah bona fides. He's already spent too much time with the wrong people. So he is identified by some of the Jewish leaders who know him from Ephesus. And at this point, if if you've been paying any attention at all to what has been happening in Acts, you know what happens next. They whip up an angry mob who's ready to stone him. They take him outside of the temple to to do that. And, And the Roman authorities, ironically, are the ones who intervene and save him. They they get involved as the Roman authorities always do whenever the peace was disturbed. They stop the crowd and arrest Paul simultaneously rescuing and capturing him. From this point on in Acts, Paul will be a prisoner of the Roman government. The state intervenes, and and this is going to set in motion the final act of Acts. In chapter 1, Jesus promised his disciples that they would be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. And for that to happen, Paul must go to Rome. Paul must go to the center of power in the ancient world. And that is where he is headed. It's occasionally hard for us to understand all this hostility toward Paul from the Jewish authorities. 
And right here, I, I should also point out that, that in Acts, there really are some strong anti-Semitic themes, which is really unfortunate. Whenever you read about the Jews or the Jewish leaders in Acts and really in other places in the New Testament, it is helpful before you jump to conclusions to remember the way that this scripture, that our holy texts have been used through history to justify persecution of the Jews. It's helpful instead to, to replace that with just thinking of the religious authorities, the religious fuddy-duddies, maybe. And we must also remember the history of the power dynamics that are in play here. You see, in these places where Paul was going to plant churches, in these places where, where Paul was preaching in the synagogues like Ephesus and Galatia and Corinth and Thessalonica, the Jewish communities there exist in diaspora. They are these fringe immigrant looked down upon countercultural religious people, these weirdos. And, and, and they are a people who have witnessed over and over and over again through their own history, through their exile, even when they read their own scripture, the bad things that seem to happen when they mix with Gentiles. The things that happen when, when they get too friendly with the way of the world. They forget who they are. They lose their identity. They lose their culture. That is what is going on here. That is the fear that these religious authorities are acting upon. They have been the marginalized people wherever they have gone, and now they have this leader that feels like he is going to get their people to lose their identity entirely. And I think that is the reason why the book of Acts resonates so powerfully in our own modern American context. Because I think Americans of all races and, and creeds and peoples have those same identities those, or I'm sorry, those same anxieties playing out in terms of our own identities. No matter who we are, we have all decided that someone else has the power. Someone else who is not us, who are not our people, are pulling the strings whether it's the immigrants, whether it's the secular government, the deep state, whether it is the religious right, we all feel like we are being persecuted. We all feel like we are the religious people in diaspora in Acts. We are afraid that it is our culture, our faith, our way of life, our language, our political party, our identity is what is under assault. And so we must not accommodate we must not fraternize with the others. Instead, we must find our people and stick with them.
But let me go back to what God's power looks like in Acts. God's power is power that is meant to be emptied. God's power is meant to be given away. God's power is meant to encourage us to cross those cultural boundaries, to cross those political or ideological boundaries. In Acts, people are given the ability to prophesy in other languages, in languages that they wouldn't know otherwise. The other thing that Acts makes clear is that In the words of Will Willimon, Paul is not a religious liberal. He's not wanting to correct his tradition, to to update his his out-of-date, backwards religious tradition and make it more modern. Paul is a radical religious conservative. Radical meaning getting back to the roots. Paul loves his Jewish religious tradition. He knows it has been inspired by God. But that at the root, it is not about isolating a community from the world. It is not about preserving itself from the impurities of evil pagans and foreigners, but being in the world to bless the world. Abraham was told that he would be the father of a nation that would be a blessing to all nations. Paul knew that his tradition was a tradition of a people being a world, a people that would love the world and that would repent from hatred of the world and that that repentance of hatred of others would be a testimony to the world so that others would repent of hatred and would repent of fear themselves. That is the message of Acts. So no matter who we are, no matter how we identify which marker of identity that that we choose to prioritize, I, I hope for most of us it is people of faith, Christians, followers of Christ that we put at the top. How can we not see ourselves as victims? How can we recognize our own power? How can we recognize our own tradition as one that calls us to love, as one that encourages us over and over and over again to cross into what is uncomfortable? to learn other languages, whether it is other religious languages or other literal languages or other cultural languages. How can we do that instead of hold on to our people, to our power, to our identity in fear? The answer is simple, but it's not easy. The answer is to remember, again, that you are loved. That God's power that is given away triumphs over all. That time and time again, God reminds us That true justice, that true peace is bigger than any political or religious identity that we could ever define for ourselves. And that that 
love will triumph. That that love will win. So how can we as Westminster be that family? We as Westminster, how can we be a people that don't seek to hold on to our members and to our building and to our property and to our tradition for tradition's sake, but to recognize our tradition as one that calls us to go out, to empty ourselves, to love and to repent and to turn over and over again. Because it is our identity that Christ has given us and God that truly matters. Amen. What wondrous love is this, O my soul, O my soul, what wondrous love is this, O my soul, Amen. Thank you, cantors. That was beautiful. Friends, we have truly heard God's word proclaimed and sung. Now we are invited to respond. How is God calling you to use your time, talents, and treasures to give of yourself this week? We come to this time of prayer, reflection, and giving. You are encouraged uh, in the sanctuary to um, leave an offering in one of our offering boxes. Uh, You can give online. Uh, 
through Venmo, um, and you are invited to offer your singing and your uh, prayer during this time. Let us now go to God. With that, our prayers have already begun. Let us now go more deeply to God in prayer. Almighty God, who taught us to pray not only for ourselves, but for people everywhere, hear us as we pray for others in the name of Christ. Inspire the whole church with your power, unity, and peace. Grant that all who trust you may obey your word and live together in love. Lead all nations in the way of justice and goodwill. Direct those who govern that they may rule fairly, maintain order, uphold all in need, and defend oppressed people, that this world may claim your rule and know true peace. Awaken all people to the danger we have inflicted upon the earth, and plant in each a reverence for all you have made, that we may preserve the delicate balance of creation for coming generations. Give grace to all who proclaim the gospel through word and sacrament and deeds of mercy, that by their teaching and example they may reveal your love for all people. Comfort and relieve, O Lord, all who are in trouble. Sorrow. Poverty. Sickness. Grief. Especially those known to us whom we name before you now in silence. Heal them in body, mind, or circumstance, working in them by your grace wonders beyond all they may dream or hope. Bring to our remembrance, O God, all those who, having served you on earth, now sing your praises eternally. May their endurance give us courage and their faithfulness give us hope. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray with the words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. going to get them swaying and clapping eventually, I promise. (laughs) Brothers and sisters, we serve a powerful God. You have been given power by this God. Use it wisely. Use it to empty yourself, to cross boundaries, and to love with courage. Go out into the world and do this, knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with all of you, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.